All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our uh, Wednesday afternoon session, Finding Cash in Other Places. Just letting some more people into the session and um, we'll get started. I'm just going to mute everyone upon entry here and uh, we will be saving any questions for the end. You can raise your hand or put your question in the chat box and we'll take those then. So I'm going to turn it over to Don. You just need to unmute yourself, Don. All right, thanks. Hopefully everyone can hear me. You guys can hear me okay? All right. Uh, thank you uh, for listening to us. I want to thank the uh, ARC of New York uh, meeting committee for allowing us the opportunity to speak. Um, if anyone thought I was going to give away my 25 years of secrets on booking non-cash transactions, uh, that isn't the case. We're going to go a little different direction in terms of social capital, talking about people. Um, just in addition to housekeeping notes, usually when I do presentations, I tell everyone to look for the fire exits. So you have to look for the fire exits in your own uh, location since we're all uh, virtually connected. Uh, if you do want to exit virtually, you can hit the button on the uh, bottom right hand corner. It says leave, but your name will pop up and, I, and I'll try to make note of uh, who left early uh, on us. Uh, hopefully our conversation will engage you enough that you won't want to leave. Um, this session was designed kind of be no stress. Uh, I, I realized that people kind of need a little bit of break. So we're gonna tell a story. Um, over the last, I think 593 days, give or take, uh, the ARC of New York chapters uh, have been facing this pandemic. Uh, I tip my hat to ARC of New York staff, chapter staff, board of governors, board of directors, and members, uh, I, I know we all have been leaning on each other these last uh, few days or few months, and, and uh, we have to do that to keep ourselves going because uh, we have a vast responsibility at the end of our work as a person. Uh, what I always try to say to people is, you know, 100% of the people we support are people, and I add 100% of the people we employ are people, uh, and we're all just trying to do the best we can uh, during some very challenging times. Um, Social capital. You guys okay? I think I'm back, right? Uh, so I'm gonna try to share my screen. I think I can do that, right? Yes, you can share your screen. All right. Sorry, I'm not a whiz uh, and I am visually impaired, so bear with me. Uh, so social capital, actually, that we were just talking earlier, that is actually one of a piece of artwork from one of our folks uh, that we kind of used in there. So uh, when I was wrote up in a write up is talking about social capital now, in, in its simplest definition, um, suppose you had to move a piano uh, in your home, perhaps maybe uh, your kids have moved on and now you need a piano and you're going to replace it with your stationary bike. Um, you might want to try to move the piano yourself. Uh, such as the gentleman uh, in this slide uh, is trying to do there. Um, but obviously, uh, you could struggle with that. Uh, you might want to invoke some help of your, friend, your friends. Um, but, you know, you're, you're still looking at the back bending and, and it's a little difficult challenge, right? Or you might want to enlist a bunch of people. And when you have more people to help you move that piano, it seems to go much easier. Uh, maybe you saved a couple hundred dollars from hiring a person. Um, and that's kind of, you know, what we're talking about is something, you know, people helping each other with various different uh, tasks or goals or skills. Uh, at this point, I'm going to pause, kind of give you a little introduction. I'm Don Mullen. I've been uh, with the ARC since uh, probably about 25 years now. And uh, with me is a good friend and colleague, uh, Sandy Benek, and I'll let her introduce herself. Hi, I'm Sandy. I have been with this ARC for 33 years, and then I was with another ARC. For eight, so I've been in the ARC family for over 40 years. Um, and social capita has always meant a lot to me, but in the past year, it's met even more. Um, earlier this year, some of you know, I lost my home to a fire. And let me tell you that social capita that happened the night of the fire and the days that followed were unbelievable. It was eight degrees and people 
stay, my neighbors stayed outside with me. They took my animals. They brought me coffee. They helped me. The next morning, my friend showed up and took me shopping because I lost everything. And then people just from around New York State just came out and supported me. Um, and hopefully next April, I'll have a new place to live. Um, I have my high school friends got me a place to rent right down the road. So it's the social capita that came is what made it survive for me. So when Don and I were talking about all these staffing crunches and stuff, we really said, we got to figure out another way. We got to figure out how to help people uh, have meaning in life um, in a different way. So Don's going to share a story um, of his friend and then we'll go from there. All right, thanks, Sandy. So I'm going to share a story of this man here, uh, John, uh, actually, uh, I met John uh, 35 years ago or so. Um, as a teenager, I was uh, walking to uh, take the bus. And uh, I remember being a little nervous being in probably one of the first times I took a bus. Uh, and I walked on, you know, got to the bus stop and immediately was greeted by this gentleman, John, I didn't know it at the time, we struck up a conversation. Uh, over the years, several times going on the Albia bus line from downtown Troy to the east side of Troy, we would be on the bus together, we would chat and, and talk. Uh, forward, uh, about 10 years after that, I get a job at Ark of Rensselaer County, and I had to collect, I was helping out to run the desk of collecting the rent and wage checks and handing out bus passes, and lo and behold, John stumbles in, and, and I'm like, oh, I remember you, and we had a nice conversation. Um, and then, you know, every time from there on every month when John came in, he would come back and he would, you know, chat and say, you know, buddy, we got to get together. And I'm like, yeah, yep, yep, we should do that. Unfortunately, uh, sadly, it, it took probably another about 10 years before us finally made the connection. Um, and me and John then just said, all right, well, let, let's go to a football game. And we went to an RPI football game. Uh, and then from time to time, we would uh, meet for lunch. And then soon after, um, John started going to my kids' uh, theater shows uh, that were going on locally. Um, and probably, I don't even, it may have been the first day, John decided he, he, he wanted to volunteer too. And, and we volunteered with you know, several different groups and, and we hooked John up to volunteering. And as see right there in this show, or this photo, he's uh, helping at the concession stand, enjoying it, having a great time, uh, handing out, you know, selling candy bars and talking to people, uh, which is one of his gifts. Um, one of my favorite stories of this time was, uh, you know, there was one show that John's birthday was January 8th, and, and he'd always joke that him and Elvis Presley shared the same birthdays. Uh, I don't think it was the same year, uh, but they were pretty close. And um, there was a show, it was, the show went on for a month. It was like Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And I think John went with me every night to those shows. Uh, and he developed connections with people in, in you know, in the theater group. And uh, he kept saying to me, you know, I I'm going to go backstage and get a picture with that Elvis character. And I'm thinking like, I I've been doing this for years with my kids. That director is not letting me backstage. I'm sorry. She just doesn't do that. Probably a copyright thing, but you're not going to get backstage, John. And he's like, no, I'm going to talk to her and, and figure out a way to get backstage. So sure enough, on the very last show, she came up to me right before the show started. We were both sitting there you know, Aaron, in the audience and she goes, John and Don, you got one minute to get John back there and get his picture with the Elvis character. So we we got John back there. There's his picture with the uh, Elvis character. And uh, he told me, you know, I got you on that one, buddy, uh, because uh, he uh, got to do that. But all through a lot of this, John expressed and was talking to me about how lonely he was, how he wanted a job. Uh, various times, he would always tell me that, you know, the job was close. He had the interview. Uh, the interview was coming up and, and he was waiting for the job offer. And then I would see him the next week and he'd be like, yeah, I'm still waiting for that job offer. Um, and, you know, finally, I'm realizing in my head, well, the job offers probably are, aren't really going to come uh, to a gentleman who's 74 years old and wants to stock shelves. I can I kind of get concede some of the concerns on local businesses. Um, at the same time, Alyssa Hobb, our chief human resource officer, and John Green, our onboarding specialist, came to me and we were talking about an idea of trying to get one of the self-advocates more involved in training and also 
they had this cool thing we were trying to do, where, you know, come to your, your first day at the Ark and have a cup of coffee uh, with us. And we need someone to kind of help manage all that. So we got kind of chatting together and, and we decided, well, geez, let's see if John, I mean, let's have John interview for that. So John had to go through an interview. We interviewed him. Uh, immediately we hired him because, you know, you can just tell he wanted to, to be customer centered, customer focused. Um, probably after his first couple days. So here's John and John in the coffee cart. Probably after the first couple of days, he came back to me and he's like, Don, you know, folks there don't just drink coffee. They want tea. They want hot cocoa. You know, my customers want more products. Uh, we need to figure out a way to get them some more products. Um, so we figured it out and we, we worked things through. Um, and then one day I, I was sitting there and meeting actually ended and I was waiting for the next meeting. And I had the opportunity to be in the spot I was in in the building and just witness the interactions that John and staff were having with each other, going back and forth, um, bantering. You know, he knew exactly what kind of coffee each person wanted. If they wanted sugar, if they didn't want sugar, if they wanted sweet and low, he would have it all ready for them. Um, in fact, I even witnessed a couple staff paying him and, and, and never really getting the coffee. And I'm like, hey, you know, you guys never got your coffee. If you, you know, he, he's selling the coffee, it's, it's not a, and they said, well, you know, the interaction with John and, and working with him was worth the dollar. I don't even want the coffee. I wanted the chance to talk with him for a couple of minutes and be his customer. Um, and meanwhile, all through this, John started developing connections uh, with a lot of different you know, staff and, and, and they were going out for lunch. They were going out for walks, um, occasional entertainment thing. Um, and he also jumped right in helping us on various different fundraising things that we did here. You know, we had a recruitment day. He was right there helping uh, the HR department um, do that. And it got to the point where prior, I, you know, John would call me two, three times a day, you know, telling me how lonely he was and how bored he was. So now I had to track John down and try to find out where he was and who he was with and, and, and looking for that connection uh, with him. Um, so his, his network, you know, grew exponentially. Um, and whether he was working with the coffee cart or, or helping in a concession stand, he was adding value to his community. And as he was adding value to his community, people were seeing him in a different light. He was no longer, you know, just someone who came and hung out in the building and, and people were, you know, looking for him to kind of get out of the building. He had a purpose in that building and, 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 a, and a reason to be there. Um, one other funny story is uh, we were helping the theater group. And this lobby at one point, I wish I took up the four picture, was absolutely you know, upstate New York. You get leaves in November and October. They, they just filled up the whole lobby. And John came to me and, and said, you know, we got to get the leaves out of here or, or someone's going to fall. So me and him hunted for the broom. And sure enough, I gave him the broom and I turned my back. And within like a minute or two, he had the whole place cleaned out of there. Was, there's not even a leaf in the picture. I don't even know how he did it. I would have still been trying to uh, push them out of the way, um, but you know, if there was a conversation or, or cleaning to be had, he, he was always a great partner uh, to be in that. And, and then about eight months after uh, we hired John to work in the coffee cart, uh, he developed, we, we, he came to me one day and he said, you know, uh, buddy, we got to talk. And I said, oh, what's up, what's going on? And he told me that um, he wanted me to go with him to a doctor's appointment uh, that he potentially uh, may have cancer because they saw some stuff on his, uh, you know, blood work. So that was one of the toughest things to do uh, as we went. Um, it was me and, and John and, and his sister and uh, Mo, the manager, uh, who we wanted there with them and, and hear the news. And you know, it was devastating us because, you know, we're like, wow, you know, he, he's really got to struggle with that. All through it, John really uh, was amazing. Uh, he kept all the spirits up. Uh, we would have conversations about, you know, different things. And John would always be like, you know, that's all right. Everything's going to be okay. You know, I, I, I did, you know, everything's going to be good. And he was actually cheering us up, but also the support that people gave him. Um, it taught me a few things that, you know, people really do rally around a person. And I said earlier, even the people we support are people, uh, people rallied around, they helped, they, they offered, you know, make meals, whatever he needed uh, during the time, because he was living, uh, he lived in a supportive apartment, so he only didn't have staff all the time. Um, 
lost my train of thought just a second. I'll get back. It also taught me that the folks we support want to work. You know, as sick as John was, he still wanted to come to work. And actually, I remember his very last day of working. Uh, I was in a meeting and staff came and got me and I said, you know, John really is not doing well physically. He, he just can't walk anymore. He, he really just can't do it. And uh, but he didn't want to let me down because I hired him. I gave him the shot. I, I gave him the opportunity to do the work and he didn't want to let me down. And, and then we had talking like, no, you're not letting me down, bud. You, you know, you really got to uh, do that. And, and a lot of the things, a lot of times, unfortunately, uh, as sad as it is, the folks we support, especially when they're dying and, and you know, they, they get confined to their house and things, you know, the only one they're seeing is paid staff. Um, and John actually with the cap, social capital that he developed and the relationships he developed, people were going to him, people were bringing lunch to him, people were stopping by. We did a card campaign. Uh, you know, people were calling him often. It, it really was heartwarming to watch uh, that process and, and him doing that. Um, and, uh, unfortunately in, uh, November of 2019, uh, you know, he just couldn't keep up with the cancer anymore and passed away. Uh, even at uh, his funeral, a lot of times, uh, you know, me and Sandy were talking that you only get a few people. John had a lot of people from a lot of walks of the community there, uh, to support him. And I think a lot of it was, you know, the ability and uh, the chance to, to kind of develop social capital, kind of develop connections. Uh, relationships with people. Uh, so I'm going to pause there. We're going to go through a little question period uh, so, and try to recap um, things. This uh, story that he told is not something that um, just always happens. You you must um, be intentional um, in order to help people. Um, sometimes it happens, but you have to be intentional in order to help people have um, social capital. So Don, why don't you just quickly talk about what is what are the intentional things that you did to help him be successful? Well, I think it started with having a conversation with him about you know being lonely and bored. And to me, you know, I I, I love working. I've been working since I was very young. I I thought you know if we can help him get a job and give him a purpose uh, that he could come in. One of the other things is. You know, we, we, we coupled that as he then also started attending some day programs, which he has never did uh, before in his thing. So, you know, trying to work at focus first to get him a job, get him connected into a, a, a group. Um, and then by his engaging personality, he, he really took over a lot of it. He, he um, you know, he, he, he found his way into the community and went working. Right. With One of the things that we often talk about is that it's about the person and sometimes um, a lot of programs do social capita they try it but it's usually the staff the person tags along with staff and so uh john could have tagged along with don to some of these events but don was in the back seat he let john be in the forefront you also need places. You really can't do it without places. If you want to just review all the, the different places that you're at with him. Yeah, so I mean, one of the things is, you know, really our first thought wasn't just getting a job here. Uh, that actually was a win-win when we found we needed it. We looked at other places, you know, we, we looked at CPA, we looked at other places for him to, to find employment uh, and find connections. And we also coupled that he did, you know, like, you know, this was a, a good environment because we were looking for someone that could do two things that could could generate, you know, bring the coffee around the building safely, uh, could clean up after him. And John, you know, certainly showed that to, to me and our other work and, and engage with people uh, where it was, you know, it was it was almost like a, an event as opposed to just buying a cup of coffee. Um, and lastly we really in order for this to really happen you need a champion and that is somebody who is gonna um really be taking the lead on it one of the things that as an agency at the arc of Rensselaer county our champion was henrietta messier and until this day i when i do things i think of her and 
for each individual that we have seen have success, um, we find they need a champion. And in this situation, it happened to be Don, but in other situations, it doesn't have to be um, a person that is employed. It could be a um, it could be a family member. It could be a sibling. It could be anybody. So well, I, actually, I too in this, I, I would say I was probably a co-champion. I mean, I was the original, like getting people connected. Uh, I really think uh, John Green and our HR department really was the champion. Uh, he helped foster all of the right things. You know, he he figured out you know the best way to help John make the coffee every day, the best way to get it set up for him. Uh, the best way to kind of let him do it himself and, and you know we were there and he, and he was especially was there for support i mean it just so happened and, you know one of the things that i you know i always say to people like oh well you, you you know a lot of the people we support well i've lived in Rensselaer county my whole life uh, in fact in the whole my whole street the whole life so a lot of the people we support i, I served at when i worked in the restaurant downtown troy and i would see them coming in uh you know for as customers or went to school with or, or know someone who went to school with so it was kind of, you know, that was one part of that, but, you know, just being, you know, like Cindy said, someone being that point person to say, you know, let's see if we, you know, maybe we could do a little things and, and make something happen for this individual, realizing that everyone has differences and everyone's going to have different, uh, you know, levels uh, of, of where they're at. I mean, one of the things we, we missed in the other is, you know, also it takes time, you know, uh, this didn't just happen overnight and, and things uh always aren't you know perfect you got to kind of give it time you got to give it space um you, you got to be in it for a commitment you know you can't just give up the first time that you know someone fails and, and me and john had that struggle too where you know uh one of the things that we, i was joking you know i from my restaurant days is you know when, when people are coming for the coffee they want their coffee before they get into work or just as they get into work and and John would be late a few days because he wanted to sleep a little later. And I would, you know, yeah, bud, you know, your, your commitment is to, to get here on time, you know. And, and uh, we would have some conversations around that. Um, and I think we covered everything, right? Yeah. So um, we're just, we're sharing two stories. Um, and one of the stories that I have is really about how social capita um, makes people have a different um, opinion of themselves. And I have a woman named Allison who was, um, was we screened for our supervised two person, Aunt Ira, and she lived in a neighboring city and she was on her own and she was pretty proud of that, but she was getting evicted because she liked to collect things. She was considered a hoarder. And at one day she ended up, um, putting something on the stove and caused a little fire. And, and she, she really um, wasn't really safe. And so um, we had her come visit us and she ended up moving into um, an apartment that we have in a big um, community um, senior housing. So it was a, a lot of older people. She was older, a lot of older people. And um, so she really came to us with a lot of stress because um, people took advantage of her when she she was always the person, she was married and her husband abused her. She had a community have staff who, um, she decided she wanted a phone like her community have staff, which was an iPhone. And you know, those things are pricey. So she was spending $400 on an iPhone and didn't know how to read. And she just knew how to answer the phone. but. She wanted to be like her community hat worker, and she also was like buying things. So she had a hearing aid that she couldn't even find that she was paying $140 for um, from an ad off the TV. So her finances were horrible. And what happened was it really helped. She couldn't take care of the only thing she really loved, which was her cat, Applejack. So we knew what to do for those things. We took care of most of them. We had her phone sold to somebody else and she got money and, and we got the company to cancel her hearing aids and we became the payee and all of that worked, but it's still, she was living in an environment where the other people in the apartment complex kind of either ignored her, didn't give her any value or actually even talk about her negatively. And 
Um, we didn't know. She was really unhappy. We didn't know what to do, but she would go to the apartment complex manager. His name's Max. He's a young guy. And he, he would say, she would be like, I need a job. Can I work for you? And he, he was like, no, I don't have anything open. So one day he called me and said, is there any way you can pay her and I'll give her a job? And I was like, well, that ain't going to work. But really, she just wants to participate. And it really isn't about the money. So he had her going from apartment to apartment, putting out the notices that, um, you know, price dropper, the van to go to price dropper is coming, or she would set up for coffee in the community room and she would unload the snacks and she would do all the things that um, he would give her that brought her value. And slowly and surely over time, people would always say hi to her. And that changed her attitude tremendously. And she really um, became a person that had value. She had a lot of social capital because she had the key to the, to the room. Like she, she knew when the van was coming, she had a lot of information. And so she could share that social capital. And the image of her not being accepted really did change in it. And it went from um, being negative to positive. And, you know, she did get a job, not there. And, you know, she is moving into an apartment, um, in a supportive apartment again. And she, because her mental status of her social capital has changed so much, I am sure she is going to be really, really successful. And so social capital is about having somebody there when you're in need, but it also is something that gives our folks confidence and an outlook that improves their mental health. So I just feel like that's super, super important that you really can't, it's priceless. You can't buy that. Cool, thanks. Let's break this down a little bit, go back to our kind of, so an intentionality, where, what do you think was like a key point in the intentionality? I think here? Max, who was the complex saw and he didn't know if he had intentionality, but neither one of us knew what the outcome would be. And so being intentional of giving her that key, being intentional of giving her control of things, unknown what the end result will be. And sometimes you just have to go and not know and hope that it works and keep changing until it does work. And then, you know, time, um, this could take over time. Yeah, it was probably a year. It was probably a year before it got it came together where it, we saw an impact on her. Um, and then the place obviously was the, the Diamond Rock where she lived. And it's about the person, like, how, how do you? And she, you know, I I don't see her all the time. She'll call me usually when things go wrong uh, because she sees me as the person who will fix things. Um, so I didn't talk to her for a while, but then um, I went up there and it, she, it is about her. And she finally got what she needed and wasn't able to articulate. She just needed to feel valued. And I think you spoke earlier about the champion was Max. Or... Max, even though he didn't even know the outcome, he was her champion. And to this day, he really talks highly of her. So it was pretty exciting. Um, less of a, I get, it's somebody giving social capita and then receiving self-worth is, is another benefit that is priceless. You can't pay for that. So I'm gonna put you on the spot. I don't know if you remember that. Hopefully you do. You were earlier when we were talking and get ready, you, were, you, you gave a definition of social capital. Um, yeah, it, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, it was really about um, re having relationships, and um, I don't know what I said, Don. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't uh, really, it, social capital is really having a group of people that um, you give and take, and, and it's a group of people that care about each other and have shared values. We care for each other. So when you put all these together, uh, we get back to our piano. Uh, you know, the, the drawing of the piano, 
and, and the best part uh, of the piano and everything works together. Um, we get a little music out of that. So I have a video, obviously, I, I'm sorry about some of the background noise of uh, this video wasn't taped to be uh, played in this, but uh, when I came across it, uh, thinking about my buddy John, I thought it was a great way to show where the music sometimes comes. And there's a piano. I, I do give a kudos to my daughter for helping us with some of the artwork. And, and that song there, John, so uh, we were at uh, an event, uh, probably a dance event, I believe in Schenectady, and uh, this, they started playing this song, and John's like, I know this song, I know this song, and after he wanted to sing it for me and, and wanted me to tape it, and, and that's something that I'll cherish uh, for the rest of my life. Um, and at that point, uh, I think that's done with our formal comments. I don't know if anyone has questions or, or comments or any stories uh, that they want to share. I don't see any right now, but if anybody has any questions or comments, you can raise your hand or unmute yourself. Oh, Peter has a question. Go ahead, Peter. Um, um, um. Um, um, <clears throat> um, I like the movie. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Hopefully, it told a story that that hit uh, close, you know, to, to your to you. Thank you, Peter. Sue. Hi. Thanks, Don. Uh, this that was great. I do have a quick question. You know, most of us, when you think of social capital, you think of a, a lot of that social capital happens between friends, as you said. And, um, you know, many times the individuals that are supported by our chapters, they have friends within their programs, but possibly not friends, their community friends or outside of the ARC family. But my question really is, um, you know, you as the executive director and, and other senior staff who may be more um, connected to the individuals might often know what their um, what the needs are, but I'm assuming anyone, including someone else in uh, who you live with, would be the person who would um, initiate social capital. I'm just curious as to how widely within your organization people look for those opportunities. I, I think it's pretty. Um, I think it's before COVID, it was a lot more. Um, people would go and um, be with others. Um, I see Sally Dunbar, who is somebody that um, her daughter, we served her daughter, and she could probably share just how much um, she provides social capita to the other people um, that we support. Um, her daughter, her one daughter got married, and the staff brought her daughter to the wedding and it just, it goes both ways. It goes from the families and the people we support being friends with the staff, but the staff bringing people to their homes, um, bringing them to things that they like and providing new experiences. It, we can provide opportunities for people to have friendships. I always say this, but we can't really provide friendship. So we try to focus on people getting opportunities. 
or, or be intentional, like with the connections, right? Where, you know, if, if two of us are going in to volunteer uh, and, you know, I'm, you know, overruling, not overruling, but overshadowing or, or, or I, you know, sometimes you just as a staff person, you got to step back and let the individual be the person that takes kind of the center, it takes on the responsibility and, and help work with the, uh, with the group as opposed to, you know, Everyone said, oh, Don, yeah, Don's great, Don's great. And, but it's not about me going to that case. In that case, it's about helping the individual and, and trying, you know, it's almost like the coach, right? Where, you know, you're, you, you don't get in the game, you don't play the game, but you're on the sidelines and hoping the individual uh, or your player, you know, and, and that's coaching scenario, you know, makes the connections and, and you kind of guide them through that process. Um, we have a question from uh, Dan Murray. Hi, everyone. Actually, I have a comment. Uh, I just want to say that I really appreciate you sharing your stories. Um, these are great. You know, and when you think about it, at the end of the day, that's what our organization is all about. And those people that like you and I, Don, have been in the field for such a long time, and many of the people on this uh, call, you know, we've had experiences similar to that, where we've had relationships built, we've seen people thrive in these type situations. So I just want to applaud you for sharing your story. Because again, I think it it embodies what we are all about. Sure, we provide supports and services, but we also try to make connections for the people in the communities that they live. So uh, great job. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, I'd like to add something and I don't know how to uh, uh, make a, you know, a wave thing here right now. Anyway, uh, sort of to back that up since uh, Sandy, uh, you know, mentioned our daughter uh, who, uh, actually passed away a year ago, rather unexpectedly. But um, really over the course of her many years and our many years of involvement in the arc of Rensselaer County, uh, there has been really so many friends um, that we and she have made um, basically with, with the staff, but beyond that, like uh, Sandy mentioned uh, the, uh, direct support staff that came to one of our daughter's weddings with Becky, but Becky went to a lot of things with her family. And Becky was nonverbal in a wheelchair, but uh, really had her own friends and her own friendships that extended to some of their extended friendships and doing things with, with them. And, and I think that that backing up uh, what was just said is part of what we at ARC are all about. And, um, and it's important really not to forget that. When I think of my own more than 40 year involvement with ARC, it began in the 1970s. And my mentor was Henrietta Messier, uh, who I remember as a young mother going and talking to uh, Albany Medical College uh, doc, uh, um, students who would be doctors and bringing pictures of my family saying, this is who we are. This is who, uh, who you know, who, who we are, not just, uh, these are the, you know, really, I'm trying to think, it's probably when, at the time that deinstitutionalization is taking place, when um, children really were entitled to be in a public school. This is when all of this was breaking in the 70s. And um, it set the pace, but I think it's something that we need to remember too and not lose sight of, because we can take for granted all these things, you know, uh, the IDA and all these rules and, you know, everything being, but it isn't really, because it's more than all of that. So it's just sort of a remembering back what we're, why, why we are all here now anyway, uh, is what this sort of uh, brings home to me. So thank you. Thank you, Sally. Anybody else have any questions or comments they'd like to give? See any more? Sue, so would you like to say any closing comments or Don? I, I actually have a follow-up question. Um, I, I'm, 
I'm thinking about social capital in um, relationships outside of the ARC family that you would typically think about. You know, um, perhaps it's it's a, a community artist who mentors a budding artist individual, maybe someone who wants to learn how to play music. You know, are, are those connections common connections that you make uh, that that's kind of social capital outside of what we typically do? out of our south direction um, there's just a little bit more flexibility um, we have a person who likes to play music and she goes and and he helps her and then she goes way out of his way to um, help us play um, yeah i think it's something definitely i mean it, it, obviously the last 18 months have been very hard and it's impacted some of that and, and you hope to be able to get back to that soon enough I think it's you know always keeping that opportunity and, and you know even when we're kind of doing fundraising events, it's it's not just so much about sometimes raising money, it's about raising awareness and, and letting people know that we are out here and we have individuals that add value to the community. Um and, and uh that way and, and you know, again, kind of also teaching staff, you know, uh, different things that over different times of you know how they can help this, you know, help um, you know, the individual make those connections. You know, going out in the community if you're just kind of just going into a, a, a big box store you know it's it's not going to happen for you right you got to kind of get a condition you know maybe join a bowling league or like you said to get, get into an art program and things like that that kind of helps because it's it kind of gives you time place you know and, and and space to let them you know things foster because it obviously you know, the connection is not just going to happen you know the first time you, you chat with someone right um last year we did a um garden because I believe um, doing a garden, we did a community garden. So we went to the, um, the place to learn how to grow. There was about five of us. Um, and then we did a community garden. So then what happened is we had a lot of vegetables. And so you say, okay, we were successful. But then they brought it to a food um, pantry. And then um, that got a little overwhelming. So we brought it and staff, bought the stuff and we put brought the money to the homeless shelter and so that process really showed the people we support again there was three or four of us that it just keeps going you can learn something and have a great skill you can grow things and then it just helped us support our community i think judy had a question yes um, I'd like to thank the both of you. I think they were wonderful stories, but I do have one question. Um, John's story and Allison's story had to have some impact personally on the both of you. And how do you feel their stories may have changed you or uh, how they just personally impacted you? Because they're wonderful stories. Mm -hmm. And I think the social capital is an amazing story to tell. And I think probably every one of us on this call have a story of our own that we could probably tell, maybe not quite as, as poignant as yours, but I think we all have them. But I would like to know how you personally uh, responded or how you felt it personally impacted on your life. Oh, it's very positive with the interaction with John because, uh, you know, um, even prior to COVID, uh, being a, a, a new uh, leader uh, is always stressful, right? Um, and, you know, you're still, even this day, three years out, you're still unsure, you know, you're doing everything right. And, and John would always provide that kind of relief for me. At the end of all his shifts, uh, he would come in and, and actually have a picture. I, I purposely took a picture uh, one day. It was uh, April 15th. I, people know me. I, I remember dates. Sorry, that, that's my father made me remember I was license plates as a kid. Um, but it was April 15th and I get back to my desk and I had a little bit of a tough admin meeting and, you know, you're, you're sitting there and, and John had a cup of coffee waiting for me. <laughs> and, and it was almost like, wow, this is a, you know, not only is, is he serving coffee, he's acting in that capacity as a friend uh, back. So it's definitely had an impact. Uh, and it's something that I always, you know, over the last 18 months draw on, especially uh, when you're facing some of the challenges that, that we're facing. And for Allison, I, I still have ongoing, she's changing apartments. So um, the impact is how do you build social capita in a different environment? And just um, 
the importance of giving people just what they need to be successful and not giving too much, not uh, being motherly, just being a guide. And that for me has been an impact that I've been able to use with other people from, from Allison. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I'm gonna turn it over to Eric. Hi. Oh, you got a question? I do, I just wanna make a comment. This is Sharon Boyd. Um, as I was thinking about all this and, and these wonderful stories and thank you for sharing them. I have to tell you a story about a very dear friend of mine who is a pastor. And he was assigned to this church where for years they had had a dayhab program down in the basement of their church. It was a very nice city, finished off basement. But it was very separate. They met there Monday through Friday. The people of the church had nothing to do. And when my dear friend was assigned as the pastor of this church, he said, why aren't we integrating our congregation, uh, you know, with, with these wonderful people in this community that's here Monday through Friday? And very intentionally, he started himself visiting the Dayhab program, making connections and doing all of that. And I won't go into all the detail, but you should see what has happened uh, after five years of him doing that. And the wonderful, you talk about social capital, it worked both ways. Uh, all of the participants in the Dayhab program have wonderful connections with the congregation. Many of them will show up at the functions of the church, will, go, will come in on a Sunday morning, but to see the congregation that sort of held them off to the side um, and not being involved with them, whole families got involved with, with them and the interaction was wonderful. So the social capital that was built both ways and when you see it go across generations within a family, it's just a beautiful thing to see. It's still ongoing and it's just a wonderful testimony to that kind of inter, you know, interaction. Awesome. Thank you. Anyone else before we close? I would just like to add one last comment. As I was thinking about the comments about the day have programs, and if you think about the volunteer work that many of our individuals do, you know, Meals on Wheels, that social capital is working right there. I think it's a perfect example because you have an individual who has the interaction of and satisfaction of providing a meal to someone who is not able to do that and and look at the other side of the door is someone who's receiving you know this meal and the kindness and the interaction of another human being at the other side and i think the same with um you know the humane society and many you know the churches and things i think that social capital happens almost every day we just didn't have a word for it yeah and and one of the things actually which is it's it's sad in, in some level but it's something that i'm hanging on to is you know me and john had plans too where uh we were going to try to take this coffee cart on the road and, and we actually had a couple of corporations uh, or businesses in Rensselaer county that were going to you know, pay for him to come in one day a week because, you know, they came here and they witnessed, you know, the, the great joy and cheerfulness. And, and even as John was going through any stage of life, he was cheering us up uh, and, and we should have been cheering him up. So it, it got a thought. And I, I do think that that's something that is always, it sticks out there as something that I think we need to pursue it as an organization is, you know, our folks have value and, and we need to try to capture it any way possible. Okay, Eric, did you want to say some closing? Yeah, yeah thanks, uh, Bridget. And <clears throat> I, I just want to thank Don and Sandy for allowing us to kind of enter their personal slash professional world. Um, obviously, you guys have a very special or had a very special relationship with John. And um, I want to build upon some comments that Judy made and Sarah and Sharon and Dan um, our work is really very unique and very special. And, um, you know, one of the things we're doing in our strategic initiatives is a, a DSP campaign called Discover the Rewards. And I would encourage everyone to go to the website. It's discovertherewards.com. But it's really about 
there are many rewards to working in our field. And you're not gonna develop those kinds of very special relationships in other industries. That's our competitive advantage. Somehow we have to bottle that, bottle this discussion and, and, and capitalize on it because I think there's a whole bunch of people who would love to work in a, a field where they can develop these sorts of special relationships. And uh, I just think this was a really great session and uh, very personal. And it's got me thinking about my next cup of coffee, to be perfectly honest with you. But um, thank you and uh, great dialogue. I appreciate everyone and everything that you guys are doing. All right. Great job, everyone. Thank you. And uh, we'll see everyone tomorrow for the Thomas A. Mall Direct Support Professional Excellence Awards at 11. Have a good evening.